Unit two, plant structure and physiology. Lesson one, plant cells. In this lesson, we're going to look at the structure of plant cells and what makes plant cells different from animal cells. One of the first things to understand about cells of any type is cell theory. Cell theory devised in the mid 1800s um, based on three main precepts. The first is a cell is a basic unit of life. Anything that's alive will consist of at least one cell. All living things are composed of cells, goes with the first one. A real key here is that all cells arise from pre-existing cells. Cells are not created from scratch by either plants or animals, but only by either combining pre-existing cells or splitting pre-existing cells apart. Why are they even called cells? Well, Robert Hooke was examining plant tissue, and it was cork bark, with a microscope. And he noticed that the tissue was composed of little separate compartments that to him resembled the small rooms that monks slept in. And in a monastery, those rooms were called cells. So he named these compartments cells, and the name stuck. This is a diagram of the structure of a plant cell. There are items here that are common to animal cells or fungi cells, but there are a few things that separate plant cells from those other types of cells as well. Some of the key things to look at here is, you'll see down in the lower right-hand corner, there's a nucleus. Plants have true nuclei that contains their main genetic material. Um, if you look in the upper left, you'll see the arrows pointing to something called plasma desmata. We'll discuss that a little bit more later. But possibly the two key items differenti differentiating plant cells from all other cells are the cell wall and the existence of chloroplasts. A third really important item is the central vacuole. Uh, and we'll discuss what role it plays in a plant uh, in a moment. So the structure of a plant cell. Plants are different from animals, and their cells are different. One of the main differences is that plant cell walls are made of cellulose. Cellulose is a tough material that adds strength to plant cells. Cellulose when combined with uh, another material, enables plant cells to hold their shape when water content is lower than optimum. That's why when you see plants that are uh, in a drought condition, they can stay standing up with their leaves out for a very long time, even though they're losing water. Um, there's a point at which they can't do that anymore, but Cellulose helps them maintain that shape. Cellulose combined with lignin forms a material that we refer to as wood. That allows some plants to grow to great heights, withstand the forces of gravity and wind, uh, plants that we call trees. Any woody type plant, including shrubs and vines, though, will contain lignin as well as cellulose. Plant cells also contain special structures called chloroplasts. And this is really the structure that contains the really cool trick that plants are able to do. Chloroplasts contain chlorophyll, which is a substance that allows plants to turn sunlight into usable plant energy through a process called photosynthesis. And only plants Algae and cyanobacteria have this ability to convert sunlight into energy. Plant cells also contain a structure called the central vacuole. Remember I mentioned that earlier. This contains water, cytoplasm, 
liquid essentially. And as a plant starts to lose water, the cell walls help hold the shape as much as possible. When the cell walls begin to bend in, the central vacuole can absorb or attempt to absorb more water, pushing out, helping the plant maintain its shape. It also helps control the movement of molecules, primarily uh, raw ingredients that the plant needs for making food, so nutrients, and the food itself, primarily sugars, between the cytosol in the vacuole and in the cell and the plant sap. And it also stores materials that the plant may need to use in physiological processes, which is simply any process that helps keep the plant alive. This slide shows a diagram of the plant cell wall. Notice in the middle of the diagram, these, get my pen available here, these structures, these long tube-like things are micro fibrils of cellulose. Notice that they go in alternating directions. They'll run one direction, then they'll run 90 degrees from that, and then they'll run 45 degrees from that. That's fairly common in most plant cells. With the middle lamella, this upper surface in the diagram, the cellulose in the middle, and the plasma membrane at the bottom, those structures together form the entire primary cell wall. And as I said, plants differ from animals because they have this cellulose, which gives them strength and helps them to hold their shape. There's another name for cellulose that you may be familiar with from uh, reading about diet and nutrition. Cellulose it is the primary ingredient of fiber. So fiber in your diet comes from cellulose and plant walls. Now, as Hook observed, these cells were individual compartments. But it's obvious that plants can take up water and nutrients from the ground through their roots and move these things all through the plant wherever they need to go. How do they accomplish that if they're, they consist of these individual compartments? They have a couple of ways to do it. Um, they're called the symplastic pathway, which is moving things through openings, or apoplastic pathways, which actually moves materials through the cell walls. The symplastic pathway uh, maybe one of the most important, moves the material between cells via special structures or openings called plasmodesma, or the plural is plasmodesmata. These openings connect the cytoplasm or the interiors of adjacent cells and allows the cells to exchange material back and forth. So if a cell needs some material, there's more of it existing in the cell next door, that material can pass through this opening and into the cell that needs the material. Manufactured items, food that the plant makes in the chloroplasts also can pass through these openings and that's the way it gets into plant sap and then moved to the storage structure of the plant. This diagram shows a plasmodesmata, or a plasmodesma. Up here, we have a cell. Here's the cell wall. Down here is another cell. Between these two cells, is this structure called the plasmodesma. 
it has the ability to regulate material that flows through it. Um, certain proteins uh, can be moved about in areas inside the plasmodesma, which will essentially pull certain materials through one way or the other. But as you can see, it's a literal connection between the two cells. So plasmodesma are the openings between cells connecting the cytoplasm. It allows the material to move. Plasmodesmata, it's the plural, can be sealed off by a plant cell if the cell is damaged, either mechanically or by disease, mechanically being something chewing on it or a person coming along with head shears or something and cutting a cell in half. If the cells didn't have a way to close that opening, then the cytoplasm from the adjacent cells would all leak out and the cells would die and eventually the plant would die. So the plants do have a mechanism for closing that off. Now, plants have a, another method of moving things in and out of a cell. It's a little more complicated and uh, in some ways a little more interesting. And that is through the plasma membrane. What happens is a plant cell wall has a plasma membrane that's constructed of a bunch of adjacent molecules. There exists in plants something called carrier proteins. Each of these proteins attracts a specific thing that a plant cell might need. These carrier proteins are allowed to pass through the cell wall. The materials themselves won't pass through the cell wall until they're being carried by the carrier protein, hence the name. Plastids. Remember we talked about chloroplasts contain chlorophyll. Chloroplasts are a type of plastid. A plastid is an organelle. It's not a full-blown organ, for instance. In a plant, a leaf is an organ, a stem, an organ. Um, these things exist within cells, within a leaf, so they're organelles. What they are are the site of manufacturing and storage of chemical compounds that the plant uses. The color of the compounds inside the plastid can affect the color of the plant cell. And then eventually the color of the entire plant. The various plastids in a plant cell all end in the suffix plast, like chloroplast, glucoplast, or permoplast. So if it ends in plast, we know it's a plastid. Here we see a diagram showing types of plastids. The, and you can see the, the faint lines connecting the various types of plastids. Oops. At the top we have a proplastid and edioplast that's connected to the chloroplast, the chromoplast. Proplastid also connects here. Now you notice there's a separate pathway going down here to these other types of plastids. The difference is these plastids are primarily the sites of manufacture of materials. These plastids are primarily the sites of storage of materials. Each one can have some of the function of the other, but those are their primary functions. We'll look at some of the types of plastids. Chloroplasts. Each cell might contain 40 or 50 of these. And it's thought that these chloroplasts have evolved from ancient cyanobacteria that were enveloped by other cells. Their structure is, in fact, very, very similar to a cyanobacteria. 
chloroplasts have internal membranes, <clears throat> pardon me, that contain chlorophyll, and they contain other molecules that are important to the process of photosynthesis. They contain stroma, which can have enzymes that help photosynthesis. They also contain ribosomes and a small amount of DNA similar to cyanobacteria. And chloroplasts can reproduce inside the cell via binary fission like bacteria. Here's a diagram of a chloroplast. In it, you can see the thycoloid, which contains the uh, chlorophyll. And chlorophyll is what gives plants, or at least plant leaves, their green color. The reason that they have this green color is because green is the color of light that plants don't really have any use for. They use light in the red end of the spectrum. They use some light in the blue end of the spectrum. They don't really make much use of light that's green. So that's just reflected off of the plant. And that's why we see plants as green. Chromoplasts are another type of plastid. And they're responsible for the colors, except for green or white that we see in plants. So if you see a red flower, or a red apple, or an orange orange, um, it has those colors because of chromoplasts. So as a fruit, for instance, ripens, its chloroplasts accumulate large quantities of carotenoid pigments. And they're converted to the chloroplast. Why tomatoes, for instance, change from red to green, or green to red, why apples change from green to red, why most fruits, in fact, change from green to whatever their final color is. <coughs> Carotenoids are a type of carbohydrate, and they absorb light in the blue range, meaning they don't use light in the red or yellow range. That gets reflected, and that's why we see those colors. Leucoplasts don't contain any pigment, so they're clear, or they may appear white. Leuco is a root word meaning white. Leucoplasts generally occur in non-synthetic, non-photosynthetic structures, primarily storage type structures, roots or tubers, that sort of thing. So think of a potato. You cut a potato open, the inside looks white. They can be specialized storage areas for starches, which are sugars, or also known as carbohydrates, for lipids, which are fats, or for proteins. So they can be called amyloplasts, helioplasts, proteinoplasts, respectively, remember from that diagram, depending on what they store. Amyloplasts, starches, helioplasts, lipids, proteinoplasts, proteins. This is a diagram of leucoplast, which is starch storage in a potato. Fall color in plants. You notice that some plants turn bright colors in fall. Why does that happen? Well, it turns out the colors are always there. Those colors exist in the chromoplasts inside the plant. But the chromoplasts generally exist at a level slightly lower than the chromoplasts in the plant cell and are masked by, masked by the chloroplasts during the growing season, so we see the plant as green. In the fall, plants get ready to shed their leaves. They stop photosynthesizing, and the chloroplasts are, the material of the chloroplasts is reabsorbed back into the plant tissue. The plant makes use of as much of it as it can and as they are absorbed, they get smaller. And the smaller they get, the more the colors below are able to be seen. 
mitochondria. This is another organelle that's composed of structures called a cristae and a matrix. What you need to know here is essentially mitochondria are the powerhouses of the cell. They generate most of the ATP that a cell uses, and ATP is the energy source for a cell. ATP is created by mitochondria through a process that breaks down sugar, and it creates energy. It's the site of cell respiration, so the biological processes that happen most dramatically in a cell happen in the mitochondria. But they also have other functions which include controlling the cell cycle when the cells mature, when the cells simply grow, when the cells die, when the cells differentiate or become a specific type of cell, and in signaling within the cell and to other cells when these processes should happen or are happening. This electromicrograph of a mitochondria, now this one happens to be a mammal lung cell, but through a microscope, uh, plant cell and animal lung cell are going to have very, very similar appearances, and you can see the folds that make up the um, cristae that contain the enzymes and molecules important for energy metabolism or turning sugar into usable energy for the plant. The matrix around that contains other enzymes that can be bound to the surface of these folds. There are also ribosomes and small amounts of DNA in mitochondria, again similar to bacteria, and mitochondria can reproduce inside a cell by binary fission, like bacteria would produce. And once again, it's thought that mitochondria arose from bacteria being engulfed by another cell. Now, we, lastly here, I think we're going to talk about osmosis in a plant cell. Notice when we said before, plants can move materials in and out of a cell. They do have some active ways of doing that, carrier proteins, um, the plasmodesma, a plasmodesma can control to an extent the things that pass through it. Osmosis is another method that plants have of letting things pass in and out of a cell or in and out of an organelle within a cell. Osmosis is a process whereby things move from an area where there's lots of it, or a high concentration, to an area where there's lower concentration until the concentration throughout is even. Imagine that you go into a room with 20 people in it, and you grab all 20 people and you shove them into a corner. You come back and look in the room 20 minutes later and the people are all spread out through the room. That's kind of what happens with osmosis. They move from an area where there's a lot of it to an area where they each have a little more breathing room. Um, plants use this process and the differential between these areas of high concentration and low concentration is called osmotic pressure. There are three states of osmosis in a plant cell. Hypertonic, isotonic, hypotonic. Hyper comes from a root word that means more. So in a hypertonic cell, there's more concentration inside than outside, so the cell tends to lose that material out of the cell. So if you have a cell that's full of water, for instance, next to a cell that doesn't have enough water, water tends to move from the cell that has a sufficient supply to the cell that needs more, simply on this process of osmotic pressure. Isotonic comes from a root word meaning equal, like an isosceles triangle has two sides that are equal. That means the same amount or same concentration of the material is inside the cell as outside the cell. So there's an even exchange in and out with no real net change inside the cell. Hypotonic comes from the word hypo that means less. 
So you have less of the material inside the cell than outside the cell. So the stuff that's outside tends to migrate inside. That evens out the pressure from inside and outside. And the result of all of this is that cells tend to like to be in an isotonic state and maintain an equilibrium with their surroundings when possible. That is the end of lesson one.